Welcome to our worship today, the third Sunday of Lent, our call to worship. We have put this time aside to worship God. Wherever we are, this time is his. We have put this time aside to grow, to root ourselves in prayer and in God's word, watered by the Holy Spirit. We have put this time aside to begin the process or continue the process of change. To look at where we are and reflect on where God wants us to be. And then to open our hearts and minds to the power of God's spirit to mould our lives and being. So that we are better able to serve God's purposes and do God's work. We have put this time aside for God. But God asks of us that what we learn today, we take on with us, to apply to the whole of our lives. So, Lord, make us ready to listen, ready to reflect, and ready to then go on and do. In Jesus' name, Amen. And so we sing our opening hymn which is number 38 in Mission Praise, As We Are Gathered. We will sing it twice through. first reading which is from the Gospel of John it will be brought to us by Andrew so our reading is from the Gospel of John chapter 2 beginning to read at verse 13 when it was almost time for the Jewish Passover Jesus went up to Jerusalem in the temple courts he found people selling cattle sheep doves and others sitting at tables exchanging money so he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts. Both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all that you do? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, It has taken 46 years to build this temple and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he spoke of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scriptures and the words that Jesus had spoken. This is the word of the Lord. 
Thanks be to God for his word to us. And so we now come to a time of prayer. Let us pray. Holy God, as we worship together today, perhaps remote in time and place, we ask that you renew our love for you. Open our eyes to see fresh things. Open our ears to hear with more clarity. Open our minds to recognize new ideas that we may be willing to grow and change and to become more like your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Loving Heavenly Father, clear our hearts and minds of all unrighteous clutter as we seek to be your church in our day. Drive out all that is unworthy of you. Let us think not of human transactions, our losses and gains, for we gather under the banner of your love that demands no price but our love in return. Help us to sacrifice all that we are to your service as Jesus sacrificed everything for us. Father God, We adore you for your patience with your wayward children, for bearing with us when our understanding is skewed and our behaviour wrong. Jesus, we adore you for being with us always, your humanity entwined with ours, for showing us the way in your life and through the word. Holy Spirit, We adore you for working through us, despite our failings, for living in us and enabling us with a greater strength than our own. Father, Son and Holy Spirit, you are wisdom in our world. You flow through creation and consciousness. Our attempts to house you in bricks and mortar are foolish. Come to us wherever we are, And lift the stones from our hearts, so that we may be your church, in word and in deed. Lord God, our ancestors turned the temple into a marketplace. Where are the marketplaces in our lives, O Lord? We confess that we are driven by the need to possess. And in our greed we plunder the earth of resources. We fail to share the good things that you have provided for our needs. We are obsessed with the work of human hands, making idols of our houses and yours. Forgive us and help us to see that your church is eternally under construction in us. But you, dear Lord, always forgive when in the Holy Spirit we choose to live. And so we lift our heads bare and humbled, casting aside thinking that was dark and jumbled. In your forgiveness we find the light to walk again in the path that is right. These prayers we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And so we come to our second reading, which is taken from the first letter to the Corinthians and is brought to us by Colin. And so we read from 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and from verse 18. Christ crucified is God's power and wisdom. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who have been saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? 
Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs, and Greeks, they look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews, and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And so we now sing our second hymn, which is number 640 in Mission Praise, The Church's One Foundation. so let us pray through the written word and the spoken word may we know your living word Jesus Christ our Savior Amen on the 1st of November just before the latest lockdown we had a service to admit myself and another local preacher Val from Hebden Royd to the office and ministry of local preacher it was a circuit-wide service, connecting ourselves here at Southgate with churches across the circuit using Zoom. And despite it being the different from the usual recognition services, it was both a great and, and humbling occasion. It was a time to thank some of those who had helped me on my way, and a time to be congratulated by others. After all, after more than five years in training, actually reaching the finishing line was an achievement. Though some might say it's not the finishing line, but only the start. On being admitted to the office and ministry of a local preacher, you receive a copy of the Bible and a letter from the president of the Methodist Conference, reminding you of the costs and the duties in fulfilling the role. And here is the Bible I received. It's the New International Version, normally my preferred version. Having tried a few different patterns of Bible reading over recent years, my resolution this year was to read it in the traditional way from start to finish. I know it isn't in the right order in terms of chronology, but at least this way 
you get a feel for the shape and the integrity of each of the books. And so, having started with Genesis and going through the stories of Exodus and then persisting through Leviticus and Numbers, which are, are full of important details, but fairly hard going, it must be said, having reprised much of what had gone before in the book of Deuteronomy, I now find myself in the book of Joshua. Now, I'm not going to do a full appraisal of this book, firstly because, well, we haven't time, but secondly because I'm only halfway through it, and I know I've read it before, but I don't want to spoil the plot for myself. So, the book of Joshua, though, certainly on the face of it, is, is a bit violent. You see, the scene is set in the first five chapters as Joshua takes up leadership of the Israelites from Moses, and he re-establishes uh, sticking to the covenant and the requirements of that, such as circumcision. But then the violence begins as Joshua and the Israelites work through the land of Canaan, attacking the various city-states that are established there. These city-states are populated by people living so-called immoral lives and worshipping false gods. And one by one they fall, and according to the description in the Bible, are wiped out. Later on in the book, it's clear that there are still people living in these cities and towns, and that perhaps the biblical language that was used before was to show total victory. But yet, if the people of Israel were following the instructions of God, this does seem quite far removed from a God of love. It's certainly far removed from the gushy sort of romantic love we perhaps often think of. This is love, but with an edge. Well, I also received at this service of recognition a, a second gift. And it's this cross. Well, more correctly, it's a crucifix. A cross with the character of Jesus still on it. Now, generally, the crucifix is worn by Roman Catholic Christians to give an emphasis, perhaps, to the work of Jesus being done on the cross. On the whole, Protestant Christians wear empty crosses, choosing to focus instead on the resurrection and Jesus' victory over the cross. If you like, the crucifix is Good Friday and the cross is Easter Sunday. Both have their merits. Both are powerful symbols of the Christian faith. I wear this crucifix, not just because it was a gift, but because in wearing it, it helps me keep the cross and its significance at the forefront of my mind as I go about my daily life. The crucifix, including as it does the symbol of the suffering and torture of Jesus, makes me feel just that little bit uncomfortable. And that might be no bad thing. Our first reading today was from the Gospel of John. Now in the Gospel of John, there are three Passovers that feature. And it seems Jesus does follow the custom of observing the Jewish festivals in the Jerusalem temple. And in the reading today, Jesus is pictured driving the traders from the temple. This story in the Gospel of John is placed at the start of his ministry. And it, if you like, leads us to read the rest of the, the Gospel in the light of John's insights that Jesus was really speaking of the temple of his body. However much we like to portray an almost sanitised image of Jesus as being a reflective man of prayer, healing people, generally being pleasant to them. Here in this story, we see Jesus displaying an edge. In this story, Jesus is angry. Not the sort of angry that we get when we imagine some wrong done against us, such as in road rage. But this is a righteous anger. Anger that makes a point and would have made a point to those present in the temple that day. And the point was that they had missed the point. The focus of the temple, the festivals and the offering of sacrifices should have been God. And the putting right of the relationship of man with God. Yet it had been made into an opportunity for increasing their own wealth and business. Well, having done this, Jesus is challenged to prove his authority for this act. And he replies, destroy this temple. And I will raise it again in three days. Naturally, it was assumed that he meant the physical temple. 
which had taken up to that point 46 years to build and it still wasn't fully finished. It was only really after his death and resurrection that the disciples believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. They then came to understand that Jesus' words announced the sign of his death and resurrection. The anger and violence displayed in the temple that day pointed to anger and violence that would eventually be done to Jesus himself. In our second reading from Corinthians, St. Paul points to this suffering. He contrasts the message about the cross with the wisdom of the world. Conventional wisdom is seen as that which serves the interests of the powerful and the rich. And this was very much the case in Corinth, where those with the right resources could obtain training in rhetoric and debate. But Paul, eloquent as he might be, lived by his manual labour. And Paul might have been expected to preach an attractive message, a message sanitised of the images of torture and pain, a message designed to appeal to his listeners. And instead he found his proclamation to be a stumbling block, literally a scandal to his own people. However much they remembered their history, the fact that they too had been slaves, they in the past had been generous to the poor, Yet they found it hard to see a crucified man hanging from a tree as anything other than cursed by God. For all its horrible violence, that moment when Jesus took on himself the whole of mankind's sin, the moment when God perhaps had to look the other way, cannot be safely sanitised. Or else we might lose some of its power in that moment of desolation on the cross, when Jesus calls out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It is in that moment that we see the ultimate act of a loving God, a love, but with an edge. So what might this mean for us? Well, as we head on towards Easter, an opportunity to celebrate. And here at Southgate, Easter may be a time when we can finally meet together again for worship, and that is certainly worth celebrating. But we are not there yet. We still have to go through Lent. We still have to go through Palm Sunday and the events of Holy Week. We still have to face the questions posed to us by the cross. And as we do so, just as it's important that the point of Christmas is not missed through the often sanitised cards and images of the season. We truly need to focus on the cross with all its pain and suffering. This pain and suffering is thrown into sharp relief by the joy of the celebration that follows. So, wear your cross with pride. These days we have to be careful not to offend and so we might not be able to wear our crosses openly at, at work and so on. But wear them underneath. You will know. And God will know. Or carry with you a cross in your pocket. One of the wooden ones that you can hold as you pray in your daily life. And secondly, when Jesus cleared the temple, the Jews at the time had missed the point. And they missed the point of his answer too. They had put their trust in the efforts of man, in a man-built temple, and in the provisions provided by the personal profits from trade. But their focus should have been their relationship with God. Yet they had put their trust into material things. Through the cross, Jesus redefines that relation that we can have with God, a relationship that transcends our man-made structures and society made norms. A relationship shaped like a cross that is focused on man's relationship with God so that man's relationships one with another can be put right so that they too can be brought into this relationship of man with God. And so, Lord Jesus, we pray, be with us this day 
in all we do or say, that we may indeed walk in your way. Amen. And so we come now to our prayers of intercession. Let us pray. Lord of the universe, we pray for our world broken by persecution, warfare and strife. We commend to you the Uyghur people in China, the people of Myanmar and the people of Yemen. You desire harmony within and between nations. You yearn for everyone to know security and safety. Lord of the world and the church, bring healing and peace. Lord of the poor and of the rich, we pray for those who live and labour in developing countries, those who are paid less than the amount they need to survive, we commend to your tender love those who are exploited, children who are paid pennies, those who work in sweatshops. You desire justice for all people. You yearn for all people to be treated fairly and equitably. Lord of the world and the church, Bring healing and peace. Lord of the doctor and the patient, we pray for our world at this time of pandemic. We commend to you those who are suffering as a result of COVID-19. Those who are working to combat the Brazilian mutation. Those who are frightened and stressed out. You desire wholeness and health for all people. You yearn for an end to the pandemic. Lord of the world and the church, bring healing and peace. Lord of the chapel and the cathedral, we pray for all places of worship throughout the world. We commend to you caretakers and cleaners, treasurers and guides, you desire holiness in your children and in the places in which they worship. Lord of the world and the church, bring healing and peace. Lord of all in need, we bring to you the prayers of our hearts. We now commend to you those about whom we are especially concerned. And in a moment's silence, we bring them to you in our hearts. You desire that your children care for one another. Lord of the world and the church, bring healing and peace. These and all our prayers we ask in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. So thank you for joining us for our worship this week. Next week will be Mothering Sunday and our worship will be led by Pamela Hales, local lay pastor and local preacher in training. So we'll see you then. But for now we sing our final hymn, which is number 442 in Mission Praise. Lord of the Church, we pray for our renewing.
And so a prayer of dismissal. We came together to worship God. We have read God's word. We have prayed and we have sung songs. Now we go into God's world to be God's people wherever we are called to go. And so let us go in Christ's name. And so we bless each other as we say together the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.